Hello and welcome everyone. We're excited to have uh, all of you attending today. I'm Jim Olson, the Assistant Executive Director of the NTCA, and I hope all of you and your families are healthy and safe. Today's webinar is titled, Why Wait? ESL Early Stage Leveling. Pre-build floor flattening or leveling is gaining popularity as it saves material costs, labor costs, improves quality of finished material installations, and expedites the construction schedule. Thank you for joining our discussion of the project specifications, scheduling, product selections, application techniques, and project metrics that are included in ESL or early stage leveling. Our sponsor for this presentation is Custom Building Products. Please look for their advertisement in Kyle Letter Magazine and multiple NTCA digital platforms. Now, before we begin, there is some business to take care of. Today's webinar will be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer all of your questions at the end of this presentation. All of our webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented. Please go to the NTCA YouTube channel, subscribe, and you'll be notified of all upcoming NTCA videos, including all technical webinars. This should give you an easier access to watch all current and past programs at your convenience. We will no longer have them archived on the NTCA website. If the audio on your computer is poor, call the number on your invite and uh, listen to uh, the program on your phone. All right, here we go. Today, we're lucky enough to have two speakers. Today's speaker, uh, Mike Michalizzi oversees all activities within the Technical Services Department, and as former Kyle, as a former Kyle Installation Company owner, his insights bring tremendous value to the top five tips educational vid video series he presents. He currently serves on technical committees for the Tile Council of North America, Materials and Methods Standards Association, or MMSA, National Tile Contractors Association. Natural Stone Institute, American National Standards Institute, and the ASTM International. Our second presenter, Will White, has over 35 years experience in the flooring industry. He is a member of the Tile Council of North America, National Tile Contractors Association, Natural Stone Institute, American Nat uh, National Standards Institute, International Concrete Institute, the technical committees of all of those, and uh, a member of the National Wood Flooring Association also. I want to thank both of you today. Mike, Will, thank you for being here. I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks to the NTCA for giving us this opportunity. Um, thank you all for joining us. Today we're going to talk about something that we feel the industry is in real need of, and we can we're asking you to help us get the word out, as well as in all of your projects as well. And that's early stage level. So the key is, if we can go to the next slide, is that every concrete floor is gonna need some surface prep. So the question comes up is, when do you do it? Do you do it early in the project, or do you do it later, when you're actually installing your finished flooring? If we go to the next slide, we'll see that, um, there are many issues with floor flatness, and that's really a big key for us as tile installers and any flooring installer, is that we need a certain amount of flatness. We know the industry standards tell us that we have to have um, certain measurements within a certain distance. And yes, as you can see in the picture, sometimes we're way out of tolerance. Sometimes there are some poor workmanship, but if we go to the next slide, we'll see that the biggest issue that we have is the scheduling of when floors are prepared for our flooring versus when the industry normally does it. The industry practices are the concrete finisher, he'll measure flatness, he'll try to pour his concrete to a certain degree of flatness and levelness for the project specification. And that's done you know, early in the project. And then much later on, the flooring uh, contractor shows up and we're way out of tolerance. So it seems kind of crazy that we do the same thing over and over and over again, and uh, something has to change. So let's go to the next slide. 
some of the issues that we see are related to slab curling. And we're gonna talk in detail as to why slabs curl, what the industry tries to do to accommodate that, and also what our needs are as contractors when we finally get in there to do our flooring. Um, as you can see here, it really is a crazy idea that we continue to do the same things over and over again and get the same results. We can go to the next slide. The issue really comes down to is that we know what these issues are. We've seen them over and over and over again. Whether we do residential or whether we do commercial projects, it's all the same. And it's not just for tile installers, it's for every flooring that goes on the, on the floor or surface uh, over concrete. We see the same issues time and time again. Go to the next slide. So what we're gonna do is talk about the organizations that have a say in how these projects are done, look at the sequence of them, and then look at some of the, the uh, different things that are done in order to achieve flatness. Let's go to the next slide. So we see here the progression of how these industries, uh, organizations, touch on a project. For example, in the beginning, we have the architectural and engineering people who give all the specifications for the project, what are necessary to be suitable for that type of usage in that building. Then we look at what ACI, the standard uh, that they have for concrete um, production or concrete uh, um, components. Also, they give recommendations on for flatness and all the other aspects of concrete themselves. When we get to ANSI, ANSI tells us how we should install the products, what products we should use, and it also gives us performance uh, specifications, many of them through uh, ASTM or ANSI uh, test methods. And then when we get to TCNA and the NTCA, we talk about how these details fit into an assembly and how each assembly is for a specific application. And then we have all the guidelines on how to apply the products um, the way that they should be done in order to have a successful installation. We go to the next slide. Um, it really comes back to, for concrete, where does flat begin? Um, what does the industry tell us? So there are standards that concrete finishers have to accommodate. They're given through various test methods, and we see here in ASTM and ACI that they're listed by FF and FL, or um, floor flatness and floor level. So there are different tolerances, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, that they have categories based on the performance that the concrete placement has to be done um, and the specifiers will call out what the classification is. So we see the various numbers that they've attributed to floor flatness and floor levelness. How does that work for us as installers? Well, it goes a little deeper because we can see the categories relate to the usage. So for example, if we talk about flooring, we look at the carpeted spaces, they're called out for um, these particular numbers. As we know, carpet doesn't need to be as flat as our hard surfaces. When we go to the next one for when we're installing tile, especially in direct bond, thin set method, well, we need a, a tighter tolerance. So the concrete finisher, he'll give you those four flatnesses, uh, floor levelness. And the reality is, is levelness really doesn't come to play too often in our assemblies unless we are doing a mortar bed and we're gonna bring it to a certain elevation. In that case, well, the floor doesn't have to be all that flat because we're gonna make it flat or we're gonna pitch it. Go to the next slide. So as we can see, here are the numbers and we see that the ACI design gives you a certain tolerance of where they're supposed to be. They come under moderately flat or flat. And so the the concrete contractor will give you that type of floor. But when we go to what we get or what we need, and we're checking out a floor with a 10 foot straight edge, well, we need it to be at a tighter tolerance. If we think about um, flooring, the standards in ASTM uh, F710 say that it has to be within 3 16 of an inch and 10 feet. 
Um, ours are a quarter of an inch and 10 feet for smaller tiles. But with the average tile size, you know, being over 18 inches, um, an eighth of an inch and 10 and a 16th and 24 is really, or a 16th within a, within a foot, that's our tolerance that we have in ANSI. If we go to the next slide. We can see that all of this relates to what happens with concrete volume change. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. How does the concrete volume and it changing due to the amount of water and moisture that's in the concrete, how does that affect our final flatness? And what does that mean for us when we get to the project and now we've got to make the floor flat? Well, if you look at the next slide, that's what we need. And I'm sure every one of us will say, that's not what we're getting. So let's uh, give our attention to Will. He's gonna talk about our insanity in our industry based on doing things the same way over and over and over again. Thanks, Mike. So Mike just covered the gap of what we all know and refer to endearingly as the gap between the division three design and placement of concrete and the division nine flatness specs or requirements. So we could clearly see that division three does its job well, uh, but the flatness specs are already short in most cases uh, of what's required for tile or flooring. So let's also talk about concretes, the nature of concrete, if you will, and factor that in. So uh, concrete <clears throat> has cement, uh, and requires water. So that water to the cement uh, ratio plays a big role in the way the concrete hydrates, cures, and that surface flatness changes uh, just over the course of the 24, 25 days after it's been placed. Um, so here you can see just a quick explanation of uh, a 0.5 uh, water to cement ratio, um, which you'll see commonly in specs. But the reality is, um, you only need about 0.22 to 0.25 or a quarter uh, of the water to properly hydrate the cement. So why the extra water? Well, if you don't add the extra water, it's the obvious, right? It's too thick. It's not possible to convey out of a truck, much less into the chute and uh, down into the pump and through the hose, et cetera. So additional water is added uh, to accommodate concrete's nature in order, in order to ease that convenience, uh, to place it correctly and finish it and give it uh, working time. So now we can understand that additional water is added and not even factoring in delays in transportation uh, from the site plant uh, or the mixed plant uh, to the job site if you're bringing it in by trucks and you don't have a mixed, site on, a mixed plant on site. Um, and then let's talk about how long it takes that water uh, to be used in the heat of hydration for the cement development. And then that additional water that's in there for the workability, uh, has, it's not going to be consumed by the cement. So it has one place to go, and that's to evaporate. So an industry rule of thumb, and you can find this on PCA, is uh, one month of dry time uh, to each inch of the thickness of the slab. So when we talk about a common six inch slab, we can understand, hey, this may take up to six months. Well, we understand that production schedules today do not allow, incorporate, or anticipate six months uh, before most flooring is installed. In the ACI, the maximum limitation for a water to cement ratio is 0.7. Uh, that's very high. Um, but in some cases is used for pumping up multiple levels into pan decks, et cetera. Understand when we get to that high end of water to cement ratio, now we're linking all the capillary pore structures together. Well, what is a capillary pore structure? These are simply the channels or little highways that are developed in the cement, in the concrete, as that extra water that's not used to hydrate the cement needs to evaporate. So it's escaping through that six inch slab up to the surface uh, to evaporate and dissipate and vapor form into the air. So now we can see that the surface bleed water begins that capillary development and then enables all that other water that's in there 
to exchange from a liquid into a vapor and come through those capillary pore structures up and out of that concrete uh, slab uh, for however long it may take, up to six months. So now, on our insanity chart, let's add on to that uh, the nature of concrete. Now, the additional water required, which contributes to mass change between concrete placement and flooring installation, and then there's the, the moisture factor uh, with the capillaries being developed by the bleed water initially uh, that can contribute to moisture-related flooring failures later. So let's talk about how long it uh, curing time before the flooring goes in. Well, we have to understand there's two separate things. There's concrete curing and concrete drying. And we know that within the first 28 days, the majority of the curing process, the development of the cement matrix in that concrete takes place. While as long as there's presence of water in the concrete slab, it will continue to cure pretty much forever. Uh, PCA has samples 200 plus years old, still curing, but at a very incremental rate. So the majority of the strength gain is achieved in 28 days in most cases. After that, it's a matter of concrete drying. That additional water that's not necessary needs to escape. So now we have a bit of a conundrum. We need to cure the concrete, we need to keep the water in as long as we can, but after 28 days, we need to let all the water go. So here we can associate water retention uh, in a concrete slab to relative humidity. Uh, these are common in our testing methods, which we'll talk about in a moment, but we use these as barometers to potential flooring failures uh, or a timeline when it's a green light to go in with flooring. And typically 85% is a marker for most tile assemblies. And then when we talk about flooring, uh, moisture vapor emission testing, uh, we can see here that in this particular test, it took 51 days just to get it down to eight pounds. Uh, so based on whatever adhesive uh, or membrane you're gonna use, uh, that could push out further delays uh, beyond 51 days. So now we've kind of pulled these things together and identified that gap between division three and division nine and all the reasons for that gap. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike and let Mike go through the curing compounds and methods. Mike? Yeah, so one of the methods that uh, concrete uh, placement includes is supplying a curing compound or some way of retaining moisture within the concrete. As Will brought out, you do have moisture that's evaporating, but in order for concrete not to curl, and in order for concrete to gain its strength, it needs a certain amount of moisture. So now the concrete finishers will apply curing compounds or do other types of methods. If we go to the next slide, we'll see um, why it's needed. So again, you see all of these uh, uh, microscopic pictures of concrete, they need moisture in order for all of these materials to react. And if you don't have the moisture, then you get a very weak concrete. So the point is, is that the concrete placement P, uh, applicators or the contractors are going to take measures. Now, these actions that they take influence the flooring installer because curing compounds, not a day goes by without multiple questions to our company and to all the other manufacturing companies as to what to do when curing compounds are placed over concrete. If we go to the next slide, we see that the other methods without curing compounds um, will accomplish the same thing. And actually their performance might be even be a little better than using curing compounds. But look at the labor that's involved. So we all know that labor is a huge part of every project and that every contractor is trying to find a way to reduce labor. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that the most common thing is now we have a concrete slab that requires some type of protection. So these various types of curing compounds are placed over the surface in order to retain moisture. And some of these curing compounds we can bond to. Um, some of your manufacturers will tell you, adhesive manufacturers, that they've tested certain curing compounds and certain chemical natures allow bonding with um, latex modified mortars. 
and waterproof membranes and other types of membranes, but some don't. And all of our manufacturers have no control over the curing compound manufacturers' formulas. So it might have tested well on one project, but if they've changed the formula for the next project, we just don't know. So oftentimes you'll get a response from a materials manufacturer. Sorry, we really don't know. Your best practice is to remove them. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see that that's what's in our guidelines and standards in all of the various technical associations. Because the way that we can guarantee that we're going to get a bond to concrete is to remove any type of contaminant. We see it in ANSI, we see it in ASTM, TCNA, and NTCA. It's very clear, free of curing compounds. So again, going back to, if we go to the next slide, um, we have the, the issue is, is that here we have a practice that incorporates materials that are causing us issues later down the road when we go to, um, when we go to install our flooring. And I'm sure many of you have had issues uh, related to talking to general contractors who wants to pay for removing curing compounds. And I'm sure some of you have gotten the uh, response that, well, the other guy will do it. Um, so this causes more trouble for us as flooring contractors. So later on, in order to fix floors, it costs you more money in the long run. As we see in this diagram, and it's a, it's a little bit of an eye chart, but you can see that this is from an actual project where floor was placed, specifications were followed, and yet if you look at the various uh, elevations in the project after being surveyed, they vary greatly, way out of the specification. So these are the, the issues that you uh, contractors are running into now where you get on a project or you're going to a project and all of a sudden now you've got your face with how do I get this floor flat? Let's go to the next slide. In addition to that, here you are, you may have even fixed the floor and you're gonna run into a situation later on that's gonna cause you trouble, all because of the practices that we're talking about. The sequencing of how products are installed, how concrete's installed, the specifications, all of these relate to problems for you down the road. So as we see in this committee report, that when the concrete contractor places a slab, the slab's very wet. So of course, you know, it's going to lay flat because the forces there causing it to curl aren't there yet. But if we go to the next slide, we see how the sequence works. In number two, you see that as the surface of the concrete dries faster than the bottom, that the surface area gets smaller, it shrinks. So that causes your cracking, that causes curling. It also causes that space underneath the concrete, wherever you have a joint, that's typically where you're gonna have a space. Space is very critical to us later on. If you take a look at slide number three, the floor contractor comes in and goes, well, you know, I've got this hump in the floor at the joint. I've got these other areas that may be low. Let me fill it all in, flatten it, grind it, make it all flat so that my finished flooring will look good. So in section number four, the tile contractor or flooring contractor installs his finish. And everything looks great for a short period of time. In number five, it shows what happens. The moisture within the concrete now equilibrates because you've got something covering it, you've got the HVAC on, and now the slab, because the moisture levels go from the bottom to the top, they're equal or fairly equal, um, the slab has a situation that's called slab relaxation. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the results. So you have all this moisture, it's now equilibrated, it's made the concrete shorter than the tile assembly, so the tile has only one place to go and that's up. And you know, many times you'll look at these and go, well, if you, know, if you had enough movement joints in there, we wouldn't have had a problem, maybe. But some of these uh, slab relaxations are so severe that uh, even with the recommended um, amount of movement joints, you may still have an issue. Let me go to the next slide. So that's where we get to early stage leveling. We're, we're gonna talk about the components in the leveling process that will help you to avoid these issues with curl, 
relaxation, um, and curing compounds, all of these things that we've been talking about that are obstacles in order for us to get our job done in a timely manner and also with all the extra cost. Go to the next slide. As we see here in the chart, and I'm not sure if you can see the little writing, but um, the bar on the left shows the traditional curing methods of concrete and the reduction of the volume change in concrete. Remember we said that when the concrete stays at the same uh, length, you don't have the slab relaxation, you don't have the pressure. Um, in the second one, you see post-applied curing compounds and the reduction of volume change. It's actually less. On the right-hand side, you see the ESL solution, whereas if you have something that traps the moisture inside the concrete, your volume change is going to be less, much less, than any other methods. 35% compared to the regular one. So let's add that to the insanity chart. Mass changes, it's insanity that we have all of these issues to deal with on, on a project. Next slide. When we think about the costs in all flooring, it's really crazy that we're spending that much money on moisture because when we know that something's going to happen and we don't prevent it, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, yes, there's some poor workmanship that relates to that and some other things beyond people's control, but to spend $2.4 billion on remediation every year, it makes people go to stained concrete, and that's not what we want. We go to the next slide. We see that people are willing to spend money on moisture treatment, but a lot of it is after the fact. And if we talk about ESL, if we talk about early stage treatment, early stage leveling, a lot of this is gonna go away. And you go to the next slide. So we used to think that it was only flooring that we had to worry about with moisture. But with tile installations, as you can see, these conditions do affect. They affect natural stone in a very big way, um, discolorations, uh, staining, and they affect the tile installations with slab curl, slab relaxation, and also um, some type of the issues with grout will have discoloration. Moisture is a big factor. We'll go to the next slide. So, Many of our contractors are doing different types of flooring, and you can see that by treating the moisture ahead of time, we'll avoid the finished uh, issues. The problem is, is that with all of these issues, um, what ends up happening is it's not just the flooring manufacturer that uh, uh, is involved in a lawsuit. The tile contractor, flooring contractors, everybody on a job site Everyone who had anything to do with this flooring is now automatically brought into any type of litigation. And that's what we're concerned about. Why not head it off in an early stage? Next slide. Let's turn our attention to Will. He's gonna talk about moisture <clears throat> testing methods. Thank you, Mike. Okay, <laughs> some of you may be familiar, uh, some of you may not be, but uh, on typical projects, uh, we're going to go in and assess the amount of moisture still in the slab before we install our tile, before we install our waterproof membrane, sheet membranes, or flooring, et cetera. Uh, some of the common methods that are used, uh, we've listed here, uh, ASTM, the plastic mat test method. This is a, an indicator or a qualifying type test. It will let you know if you have a potential high moisture level uh, present in the concrete slab. Uh, and then we have the uh, electronic impedance or moisture meter. A lot of the flooring contractors use these. Uh, the technologies have been improved quite a bit. And again, they are a qualifying type test as well. And then we move into your calcium chloride test uh, that takes 60 hours minimum still today, which is three days. And then we move over to our relative humidity test. Uh, both the relative and the calcium chloride are quantitative tests, which means the data that we uh, retrieve from the job site is accurate at that moment in time. 
uh, and it's not a qualifier, it's quantitative. So uh, the relative humidity test has made some massive improvements in uh, using technologies to remotely read your levels uh, using an app on your phone and has narrowed the 60 hour test window down to 24 hours. Uh, but still requires multiple sites uh, and still takes at least a day uh, and then requires reporting after that. And we look at ASTM F710 at the bottom, uh, that requires a pH testing as well. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do moisture testing, you should always include pH testing. But here we have five methods available, uh, three of which are commonly used and specified uh, before we put any kind of flooring in that may be sensitive or we're looking to install our flooring earlier than 28 days. So we can add that to our insanity chart, uh, which is growing, right? Uh, all of these things uh, are associated with a dollar value that impact the total project cost. And not to mention our traditional methods of construction still involve uh, a lot of challenges when it comes to quality control uh, on the project. And it's not just to flooring or to tile, uh, but it's to other trades as well. Uh, floor framing, millwork, et cetera, door jams, you name it. You shim a door jam, the flooring contractor comes in and uh, goes to remove the shims and damages the door jam, installs the flooring anyway. And now we've got a punch list and we've got back charges. So uh, just more to add to that insanity list uh, that just keeps growing. So I'm gonna let Mike jump in and talk about early stage leveling uh, specification and planning. Mike? Right, so with every project, planning is key. I mean, if we don't have a plan, if we don't communicate, uh, you're looking for a failure. So this type of project, if we're gonna do some early stage leveling, we have to communicate what our goals are, what our needs are in order to accomplish it and do it right. And that goes back to job site meetings, um, that goes to um, looking over the specification and just verifying all of that so that we make sure that we get things started at the right time. And if we go to our next slide, we'll see that in this process, um, it really comes down to applying the product that treats the concrete early so you don't have all of these issues ahead of time. So it, or in the in the end. What you have to do with your specification is the specification calls out for the various assembly of products, but also the timing and also what else you're going to do in between. So you have to communicate that to the um, project owners, get them to understand that you're gonna go in there and you're gonna do this early stage leveling. Once you're armed with what the specification and what this assembly and system does for you, it's easy to sell it to them because the cost savings and the uh, avoidance of all of these delays in construction are gonna make their job flow a lot easier. Will, show us how it's done. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so um, instead of coming in to uh, treat the concrete, flatten the floors in the division nine section, uh, or at that timing on the project after the shelves been enclosed and interior walls are built out, this particular process will be going in early and more specified under the 0300 section uh, to accommodate the production uh, scheduling on the project, which even has some added value uh, and time savings and time is money as well, right? So imagine pulling up to a four or five story building that's been enclosed that has freight elevators or exterior freight elevators working uh, with a long line of trades that are trying to get up and to get into their floors to do their work. And you've got all this amount of material that you've got to load in and get up there. Uh, it's going to take time. It takes a lot of lobbying uh, to get access to that freight elevator over and over and over to get these materials, these pallets and pallets up to the floors where you need them. Well, going in early will give you the opportunity just to use you know, your petty bone or use the crane even to swing these into each floor as needed. So makes it very easy, doesn't tie up any freight elevators and uh, saves a lot of time. Um, a lot of conversation about, do we need to shop blast concrete floors? Don't we need to, what, what is the position? Well, the reality of it 
is to bond over a concrete surface. We understand it needs to be clean, sound, and stable. Uh, but some of the key points are it needs to be latent free, uh, and that's just weak surface concrete. And it needs to be efflorescence free, which is a lot of the salts and the uh, mineral deposits that are brought up by the bleed water in the early stages of the concrete uh, process. So the answer is no, you don't have to shoot the floor. Here's what we need. We need a surface profile, right? We don't want a polished, shiny profile because in that process, we close off all of our surface pore structure, so we can't get absorption. We don't achieve uh, the optimal bonds that we want, not just for primers, but for thin sets, membranes, etc. So the caveats here are give us a, a two in a concrete surface profile or a three uh, in the finishing process. Uh, and you won't have to pay or execute shot blasting. Make sure it's latent free and efflorescence free. So on this particular project that utilized the ESL system, you can see on the left photo and on the left portion of the photo, you have a five day old concrete slab and you can clearly see that money was saved and power troweling and steel troweling was never specified on this concrete pan deck. It was simply placed screed it off and had a bull float finish to it. So they elected to go with a brush blast as the most means of cleaning that floor off from uh, latents and dirt and dust and et cetera. So that uh, wasn't required, uh, but that, that was the most cost-effective and time-saving method. And you can see here, the floor is now clean. So what's our next step? So we did zero for planning with our architectural specifications, our general contractor's production schedule. Uh, we did one, we cleaned that slab, and now we're gonna go into a moisture mitigation application. Uh, this particular membrane is what's going to close that slab off from further drying at differential rates. Now the additional water that's in the concrete will still ultimately dissipate but just over a much longer period of time and will never migrate through this mitigation system to uh, have negative impacts on flooring that's installed above it. So it, it can affect adhesives, et cetera. And it is installed for the ASTM installation method uh, F3010, which is specific to a resin-based membrane forming uh, moisture mitigation system. So before we apply a monolithic coverage, we evaluate that surface, it's clean now. And if we find that for some reason in the first five days, we've got some hairline cracking or maybe even any kind of trade damage already uh, to that surface slab, we're gonna go in and use the same mitigation epoxy to do any crack or surface repairs before we do our monolithic coat. This isn't very time consuming at all, um, to simply, uh, gravity feed or poured into those cracks. And then if you have wider cracks for some reason, you can add sand to that epoxy mixture and make an epoxy patch. And once that's been applied, you don't have to wait for it to, to dry. As a matter of fact, you don't want to wait for it to dry. So immediately after that's been applied, you begin your uh, production mixing on your moisture mitigation system. Uh, I particularly like this shot because they're utilizing the lid to protect any back spatter, uh, but it's very, very simple. It's a two-part system. Uh, put all of your catalyst into your resin, uh, mix with a low-speed drill, proper mixing paddle, and once that's completed, you get it right over to the slab area that you're going to place it over, and you ribbon pour it out immediately because the exothermic reaction has already begun to take place. We don't want to leave it in a bucket. And then we're going to squeegee apply it across the face of that slab in large areas. And you can see this, this project, this crew had adequate staffing, well-planned, everybody knew their role. Uh, and on the note of role, you can see here, we have 18 inch cage rollers that after the squeegee has come across with the epoxy, they're just gonna back roll it to ensure even distribution and here we see a nine-inch nine roller being used just to cut in perimeters and obstructions on that slab surface. And then we simply allow it to cure. 
that's it. We don't have to broadcast any sand, no special treatments here. And, and the benefit of going in at this stage with a, a, a resin-based system is you can have excellent ventilation. So this just adds to the safer piece uh, of the system's attributes. Uh, after the membrane has dried, now we can bring in a single component primer. Uh, with the advancements in polymer technologies to, you know, today and, and over the last five or several years, uh, we are now working with hybrid polymer and monomer chains, so they're much stronger. Uh, seven, eight years ago, we'd have to use an epoxy-based primer over epoxy before we were going to do any kind of leveling. Not the case today. So now we have a single component primer in our ESL system that is simply applied after the moisture mitigation system has dried uh, and applied in the same manner with a clean 18 inch cage roller, uh, cut in the perimeter, and then you can field roll it very, very fast, very, very efficient. And typically in this application, it won't take much longer than 30 or 40 minutes before it dries. And now once it's dry, we are ready to begin mixing and uh, placing or pouring our leveler, flattening, uh, whatever we're trying to do to the floor. Well, I'll tell you what we're trying to do. We're just trying to create an even flat plane. And because we're going in early, we're gonna use substantially less self-leveling underlayment to achieve a flat surface. That's our goal. Uh, level is not our goal in this case. We're trying to meet the flooring standards by flattening the floor. So mix the product, have your crew. In this case, they elected to do the entire project uh, by barrel mixing or barrel brigade. Uh, they did a very efficient application. And you can see here, even the perimeter on the pan deck did not need to be retained uh, with any type of damming. It accommodated that placement. And instead of using a half inch or up to two inches of leveler, it was more along the lines of a quarter to three eighths inch in depth nominally. So a huge savings in the amount of uh, materials used on the project. Uh, simply gauging it out, you'll look behind this uh, contractor that's gauging the material and you don't see all those pin markers because they didn't need to survey the floor. Another savings. All they're after is to create a flat surface. They did some nominal amounts of surveying, a few markers, but no extensive surveying required. And then you see a simple smoothing tool used. Uh, this is just to break that surface tension of that leveler that has all that energy in it uh, from the mixing process. And uh, voila, let the materials dry on this large pour. And once they're dry, now the general contractor can come in and begin that enclosure, begin building interior walls out, can even bring in scissor lifts uh, seven days after placement. So it doesn't slow the production uh, process on uh, the general contractor scheduling. Now, without enclosure, we know it's going to take time, but we anticipate some intermittent exposures to uh, rain, dew, uh, all we ask is that you squeegee or boom those off on a daily basis and don't allow that floor surface to be saturated for extended periods of time. Mike? Thanks, Will. So here's where the big crux of the matter is. Every time we do a floor, we have to put our name on it, right? As a contractor, we have to warranty that for a period of time. All the things that we've talked about earlier can negate the performance of the assembly. Whereas if we are the persons we have to warranty all of this, regardless of what the issues are, we're always brought in in order to deal with the problems that come in afterward. And you know how it always goes. The flooring contractor is the first person that gets pointed to for all the problems. And your name is on the warranty. So if we go to the next slide, we see here that this system virtually eliminates a lot of the major issues that we've run into for flooring prep and leveling and flatness. All of these things are dealt with early in the project. So when we get on the project, and we're always the last ones on there with all the other finishes, and we're crawling over everybody to get our job done, we don't have to worry that we have to rush, which could affect our warranty, take shortcuts in order to get the job done. Now we know We've got a floor we can count on, 
And all we have to do is take care of the little schmutz that might be on the surface before we uh, install our product. And that's a lot easier than dealing with all these other issues that we did before. So it does affect our warranty. Some of the things that you'll see in the warranties from the manufacturers of the products is that they're going to warranty that their products are gonna meet the compliance that we have inside of all the associated um, groups that we have on our left and meet the standards that are for ASTM F710 and also for the moisture conditions that might affect moisture sensitive tile or stone, um, moisture sensitive products in the assembly. If you go to the next slide, we also know that the products that are going to be used like the leveler, um, you're going to see that when you get on that project, the leveling's been done, nothing's a last minute thing that you have to worry about. Um, and you've also incorporated your warranty for all the other products, all the other flooring assemblies, and your manufacturer is gonna warrant not just the tile insulation, but they're gonna warrant all the other flooring over it um, based on the conditions that need to be done with a leveler or with a moisture mitigation system. Next slide. So the question is, what are you gonna do with this information? The opportunity is there, you know, get in on the ground floor, get in there early in the specification. How often is it that we um, get a say in how the concrete is done? In this application, now we're going to affect the concrete in order to make it so that not just us, but every floor that goes into this project is gonna be suitable in order for its use. Next slide. Will's gonna talk about a, an act, some actual projects. Excellent, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> okay, so aside from uh, all the other elements that we discussed in way of value, uh, we did mention there was uh, cost savings on material usage because you've gone in early before the substantial mass change at the surface of the concrete takes place. So here we have a project, uh, it was four towers, two towers were built at, at uh, relatively the same time. Uh, the surface prep contractor on the first phase or the first two towers went with a uh, traditional scheduling outlined by the general contractor and went in after the uh, shells were enclosed and the interior walls were built and went in and worked around all the other trades, et cetera. And for the first two towers, it was over a million dollars just for the surface preparation, uh, flattening of those floors for those two towers. Uh, after all the challenges of working around the walls and the, fighting the other trades and fighting for uh, time and space and elevators, et cetera, the surface prep contractor convinced the general contractor to let them go in with an early stage leveling system on the second set of towers. <clears throat> and the savings just on his contract alone was dramatic as you can see. That was over $250,000 savings uh, for that second phase of those second two towers. So $125,000 per tower was saved just in the labor and material costs for the surface preparation. Uh, the project, the phase two, the second two towers, finished completion, occupancy, everything, 10 days earlier than the first phase. Um, the first phase had ongoing punch list items and back charge issues uh, that had to be dealt with uh, much longer and uh, much lengthier than the second two towers. So uh, just some numbers and data to share with you on the reality of the savings just from the surface prep contracts alone. So now we know, you know it saves you money, uh, you're treating that concrete slab earlier, you're preventing that, uh, the majority of that movement, it's going to take place. You're definitely preventing any uh, slab relaxation from taking place and contributing to floor failures. Uh, using that moisture mitigation system, it doesn't matter what floor goes over it, uh, they're all protected. Uh, and that mitigation system isn't just protecting moisture, it's what's uh, protecting the concrete from experiencing all that uh, mass change and curling. And then the quality of the flooring and tile installation goes up dramatically because. Now I don't have to build and rush to get it done and 
kind of skirt what I should be doing in order to meet deadlines. And then uh, the savings from all the other trades. Uh, and then one of the best pieces about the ESL is, uh, you know, whatever goes over it uh, in way of the early stage leveling system is completely covered uh, by the warranty uh, from that flattening and leveling system. So that's why we kind of tagged it faster, cleaner, smarter, and safer, uh, not only to the flooring, uh, but to the contractors using the system versus your traditional timing and traditional approach. So Mike, I don't know if you have anything to add. I, I, think, uh, I think we're there. We can take some questions. Oh, I think we're covered. Thanks everybody for listening. Absolutely, thank you Great. everybody. Great job, you guys. Um, uh, lots of information, fantastic information, and uh, I think everybody likes saving time and money, so uh, great, great job. We do have some questions here. Um, the first question is, is a de densifier considered a curing compound? Mike? Well, um, so if you're going to densify the, con the concrete surface, you're going to make it harder. Um, is that going to is that going to reduce the amount of moisture that escapes to some degree? I'd have to rely on the curing compound or densifier manufacturer in order to you know give us the characteristics of their formula. Good answer. It's Great. a good question. Densifiers are commonly used for polishing, Jim. Um, you know they're used in part of a polishing process with a floor grinder, uh, but they're also used for a short term. Uh, curing compound applications. So the next part of this question, you probably already answered, but I'm going to ask it just to make sure. Is there a benefit to densifying after the cement is poured? Uh, you know, the, the benefits of densifying a concrete slab after it's poured is going to be relevant to the concrete's use. So if I'm going to pour a slab for a warehouse area, it's not going to receive a floor finish. Uh, then densifying it and power troweling it is definitely going to be beneficial. Uh, if I have a, a slab that I want to install floor coverings over, uh, densifying it uh, would not, should not be used with power troweling because that's only going to close our surface off and work against us. So we're going to definitely have to go back in and uh, shoot the floor or grind the floor to open it back up. But if densifiers are used alone, they can be viewed upon as part of that curing process or a curing compound for short-term uh, retention and reduction of dissipation of the water. Great. So what percentage of moisture should be allowed before uh, the other work starts, the floor covering starts? Well, a lot of it is determined by the floor finish. So some products require lower amounts of moisture, some products breathe, and the measurements by the moisture meters or by the moisture uh, test methods vary based on the product. So you'll get, you know, wood flooring will have a certain percentage, uh, certain resilient rubber will have, you know, one carpet will have another. Uh, if you have a backed carpet, like a rubber backed or any type like that, it's going to require, you know, lower amounts of moisture. Um, we have moisture sensitive stone and tile, agglomerate tile that, that can have very little moisture. Um, and then we have products like terrazzo tile that can handle a lot of moisture when it's direct bonded to concrete. So it really varies. The floor finish manufacturer sets the number and that's what we have to all go by. Usually the products with under the assembly are gonna work just fine. The only exception to that is typically epoxy grout, which requires a very low moisture rating. Otherwise, a, a vapor can actually push the epoxy during its curing process, push the epoxy right out of the joint. So to simplify that great answer, uh, <laughs> check, with the, check with the manufacturer of uh, the uh, floor covering and they will let you know what that yeah. moisture can yeah. And if I can, I'd like to add just a little on to that. Um, uh, we talked earlier about the advancements in the polymer technology, Jim. And, uh, you know, that's obviously translated into advancements in flooring adhesives and their uh, resistance or capabilities of going over slabs with higher moisture conditions. So you have wood flooring adhesives out there uh, that will handle up to 100% relative humidity, right? 
you have vinyl glues that'll do the same thing. These materials are gonna cost more money because of the technology put into the product. So you have to cost the project. Does it make more sense to go in with an early stage leveling or do traditional and then pay the money and the adhesives tolerances above it? So there's that to consider, but the ESL system by far is more cost effective rather than you know paying for higher performing adhesives later. Great, good, good clarification. So here, this one's a little longer, so uh, pay attention. <laughs> what about epoxy moisture mitigation um, coatings? It will, uh, he had, this gentleman had a project that was installed on a large courthouse to deal with moisture for large amount of sheet vinyl on the project. To cover um, himself, he ground the surface clean before installing membrane. Are there always, um, are there any other ways to avoid this additional labor? The additional the, labor of grinding or the moisture mitigation system? How about let's answer both. Uh, I mentioned earlier that shot blasting isn't required. It's just one method that will get you to what is required. What is required is that mild surface profile, right? That CSP of a two. And then it has to be sound and stable, which we all say in all of the different industry organizations. And then it has to be clean. So uh, this gentleman, he, he ground the floor. Uh, that's an option uh, to get that floor there. So uh, if it required grinding, it required grinding or shop blasting. So uh, no, no way to really get around that. Uh, but the moisture mitigation that was employed was to protect the sheet vinyl. Well, if the sheet vinyl manufacturer uh, allowed an adhesive to be used that would uh, take place of the mitigation system in way of its tolerance to uh, relative humidity and moisture vapor, then the answer is it's possible he may not have needed to put a moisture mitigation system down. So Will, he, uh, he came back and said uh, grinding off the epoxy to install cracked membranes is what he was talking about. Oh, really? Uh, so that's, that's gonna be a consult with your manufacturer basis. Uh, most of the large manufacturers like ourselves um, have primers uh, and, and treatments available to interface over existing coatings if they are in sound and stable conditions. Um, and, and at the worst case, if a, an epoxy coating has been down for a long time, maybe you just need to screen the floor and clean it if it's in good shape. So I would say, you know, reach out to Custom or uh, another manufacturer if you use them and ask them that question. And I can tell you right now with a, our situation, a lot of our reps and even our technical call center is using uh, FaceTime uh, to help contractors on the job answer questions just like that. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. Um, so can um, partition walls be painted through the ESL system? Yes, they can, and that's expected. Um, moisture doesn't travel sideways very well. So when you um, have penetrations or you have walls uh, and your your flooring is not going you know, in between or under a partition, so it's uh, accepted that you're able to penetrate it. And the levelers, you can shoot through the levelers uh, without any difficulty in order to place a, a wall. All right, guys, that is the end of our questions. Uh, I wanna thank both of you again for an unbelievable presentation. I wanna thank all of our attendees for uh, being here. I want them to know that uh, an invite will be coming for a July 8th, July 28th webinar. Please look for that. And I wanna thank you all and tell everyone, please stay safe and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Appreciate you. Yep, take care. Stay safe.